So um, I'm here to introduce to you Tyler Moore, who comes from the computer laboratory of the University of Cambridge, works with uh, Ross Anderson. And the title of the talk is The Economics of Information Security, so a very important and interesting topic. And thanks, Tyler, for speaking to us about it. Thanks. Thanks, Stefano. Um, actually, uh, having just heard Stefano's talk, uh, I think it's quite nice. Quite, it serves as a quite nice motivation for what I'm going to be speaking about, because when he mentioned that, uh, you know, we, that as security consultants we we, we push out these um, we push out these predictions for what attackers are going to do in the future, uh, and you know, we may be very good at doing technical work. Um, we can we can study what a technical vulnerability is. But uh, if we don't understand the underlying motivations and incentives for what, why the attackers behave in the way that they do, um, we get it spectacularly wrong. And as it turns out, fairly simple economic analysis can provide a lot of very valuable and correct insight into uh, what's going on in information security. So. So first, I'm just going to start with an overview of some of the key results in this area of uh, in economics of security, um, and then I'll go into a partic couple of particular examples. And finally, uh, the last half of the talk, I'll kind of go as a, serve as a case study in some of the research that I've been doing, uh, looking at uh, phishing attacks in particular and studying the uh, interaction between the attack, the, those who are carrying out the attacks and the different organizations responsible for defending against these attacks. Um, all right. so. Um, so over the past few years, we've started to apply economic analysis to uh, information security. And it turns out that this works a lot better than technical analysis alone. Um, and you've, you've also got uh, firms which are using security mechanisms to further their own uh, business aims, um, which uh, is OK. But uh, if, as long as this is happening, we need to, we need to think economically to, ex to explain uh, wh why the, me the security mechanisms are being used in this fashion. Um, and sort of one of the big problems is that we don't have a lot of access to good, comparable information. Don't have, we, may, we may have a lot of data, but it's loaded with biases, like Stefano was talking about. Uh, and so we need better information uh, to improve uh, the allocation of resources to uh, Defending, defending our computer systems. Um, so back in the day, people used to think that the internet was insecure um, because we just didn't have enough features. We, we just don't have quite the right technical uh, uh, protocols designed. So we uh, don't have the right authentication mechanisms in place. We need two-factor authentication, no mutual authentication. All these, if we just can just get those, this new technical solution pushed out, all our problems will be solved. Uh, so we worked on, we've, we've provided better solutions, uh, AES, PKI, the list goes on. Uh, and so, but really, no matter what we do, um, the, there are more, more new, better secure protocols that keep coming out, but uh, no one is claiming that the, that the world is getting any more secure uh, on the internet. Um, so when you take a step back and look at sort of the incentives, uh, that are in place. It, it kind of explains things quite nicely. Um, so the first classic example um, my supervisor came up, came up with about 10 years back, uh, he looked at the fraud incidences of uh, on ATMs uh, in the UK and compared that to the US. Um, and what he, what he found is that, uh, surprisingly, in the UK, they were, they were suffering much higher levels of fraud um, than in the US. Um, but he also, he also noticed that in the UK, banks are less, were originally less liable to fraud. The onus was on the consumer to prove uh, that, uh, they were, that they were not responsible for uh, the fraud. Um, so as a result, they became, ended up becoming careless, and you went, they ended up, ended up spending more money on more money and suffering more fraud. Um, you, have, you have these distributed denial of service attacks with, where you have malware that gets Kadoot installed and it's not really concerned about uh, about affecting the computer that it uses. It just, it just wants to uh, use that com compromised machine as a vector for launching a further attack. Um, and then you have this question is, why is Microsoft software insecure? Or, and despite its market dominance, shouldn't, shouldn't, a, shouldn't the most secure, best product be the one which wins in the market? Um, so but when you think about incentives, it's 
these, these systems are often secure because the people who could fix them don't have the right incentive to do so. It's the bank customers who suffer when you have poorly designed banking systems uh, that make fraud and phishing easier. It's the patients who suffer when uh, the hospital systems admi administrators uh, put their own interests before uh, the, the interests of patient privacy. Um, it's casino websites that, that get hit by the DDoS attacks, uh, not the consumer, the consumer machines which are compromised and used in, in the botnet. Um, so this is, this is an example of, of security being used in, as an externality, an economic side effect, uh, kind of like in, environmental pollution. Um, so where you have, you have an interaction that goes on and um, the effect, the effect is, is onto a third party. Um, right, so we're also starting to see uh, information security mechanisms uh, used in new interesting ways uh, to protect business interests. This has started initially with printer cartridges. Uh, Xerox introduced a mechanism to authenticate the printer cartridges to the printer. So they had a business model where they subsidized printers um, and so people buy, are happy to buy the cheap printers but then they get discouraged when they have to go pay uh, 30 euros for a new, uh, for a new printer cartridge. Um, so people started to work around it. Um, but so what you have here is, is, a, is a system, um, a security mechanism whose sole design is to support a business model. There's, there's the threat, the, there's not some nefarious attacker which is, which is wanting to do this, it's, it's someone trying to save a little money. Um, and you're seeing accessory control spread to all sorts of industries, to the auto industry, cars are, starting to, are, are trying to start authenticating uh, replacement parts, uh, for example. Um, and you have digital uses of digital, digital rights management, which can influence the outcomes of markets. Um, you know, Apple has grabbed great, you know, complete control of the music download industry, uh, and until recently, they they had their DRM, which which meant that you could only uh, you could only use uh, you could only use the the uh, songs you buy off iTunes onto uh, the Apple encoded uh, DRM. Standard, but they've, they've since they've since relinquished this be only because uh, the other the other uh, music labels have realized that they're they're losing out because Apple has completely c conquered the market this way. Um, you have Microsoft, which is trying to control the distribution of uh, high high definition video content, but, and you, you digital rights management me mechanisms are uh, enabling that. Um, so, but what? The general thing here is that there's this strong contradiction between uh, the components of a network and the components of a system being distributed further and further out, and devices are becoming smarter and more capable, um, but the operators which provide these services want to retain control, so they're trying to retain control remotely. Um, so. Uh, why, why, why is it that we have such dominant firms in the software industry? Um, so information industries are structured very different to your standard industry, your standard you know, manufacturing industries. You have very high fixed costs and very low marginal costs, meaning you have to spend a lot of money paying your programmers to write the code in the first place, but once it's written, uh, you can distribute it for virtually nothing. So the cost of each additional uh, copy costs you, costs you very little. This means, this leads to very, and very competitive pricing where uh, people try to uh, sell closer and closer to the marginal cost, and the marginal cost in this case is zero. Um, so you also have network effects where the value of a piece of software depends upon the, the user base. The, the, more, the more people which are using the software um, makes it more valuable to develop applications for it, for example. And so the, 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 the company that gets in there first and sells the product for the cheapest gets, gets, the, gets the market share and then once they're there it's very hard to, it's very hard to change. So Microsoft's initial philosophy of hurrying and pushing out their software even when it was insecure um, was quite reasonable for them. To, was quite reasonable for them to do this. And he, if, if they had waited and, and held off until uh, they were already, until they were already had every, every, all their ducks in a row and everything was secure, um, they would have lost out to someone else. They can, they could afford to do that with Vista because they already were entrenched. Um, then the next thing you have to do in an information industry is you have to 
appeal to the vendors of complementary products. So if you're, if you're Microsoft, you're providing the operating system, you need to make it as easy as possible for the application developers to add third-party applications. Um, so, the, in fact, the lack of security is, is another example of, of how Windows was made, easy, made it easier for the third-party vendors to actually to develop software for its system. If you have very onerous and strict uh, security checks on your APIs, then uh, it's, going to, it's going to be harder for your third-party developers to provide the uh, applications which make the software attractive. Um, so let me, let me now talk about sort of what I think one of the, the biggest problems that uh, can be explained by economics, and that is the uh, existence of asymmetric information, where you have some, one party has better information than, than the other party, which uh, can lead to perverse outcomes. So there's this, there's this um, professor at Berkeley called George Akerlof who won a Nobel Prize for uh, describing this market for lemons, where he, he used the used car market as a, mar as a metaphor for a market that has asymmetric information present in it. Um, so basically, you're trying to buy a used car, uh, but the buyers cannot easily determine uh, the quality of the car that they're, that they're looking at. So uh, they, don't, they don't know if it's going to be a very a cherry, a, a very nice car, or a lemon, one that's got all sorts of problems. You, you see two cars, there's no easy way for a consumer to differentiate from one type of car to the next. So the sellers know this, okay? So the, the, the buyer is unwilling to pay a premium for the car, and the sellers, in turn, will not the, so the market price drops down to the, car, the price for a cheaper car, for the, the poor quality car. And the sellers know this, so they only, they only will be willing to sell their car if it is a poor quality. Because if you have a very nice used car and the, the market price is, is, is too low, you say, well, no, my car, is, my car is very good and reliable. I'm not going to sell it for that price. Um, so the same, the same Asymmetric information exists in the software market. Um, you have security vendors who tout the security of their products. They market, their, they market the security of their products. But it's, it's often very difficult to ascertain, as a consumer of these products, whether or not one, one type of system software is more secure than the other. All you have is marketing, effectively, right now. Um, so buyers aren't going to pay a premium for something which claims to be more secure. Um, because, because there, in fact, it could just be lies. Um, and so, so the, sell, the providers, the secu vendors themselves, will not actually even make secure software because they aren't financially rewarded for doing so. So in the end, you end up getting insecure software because uh, that's, what the market, that's what the market decides. So how, how can we reduce this particular type of a information, this asymmetry? Well, one proposal has been to um, set up a market for vulnerabilities. Um, so what you could do is you, can just, you could just establish a market price for a previously undisclosed uh, vulnerability. Um, and this, this provides a couple of, a couple of uh, features. One, it will provide more information about, the, about uh, undisclosed vulnerabilities. But the price of it will, will inform uh, the consumer as to which, which product is harder to get a zero-day exploit for. Because if, if what, the idea is you raise the price that you, uh, you offer over time, and then uh, hackers will, will only get interested once they're starting to get paid more and more money, and they make more and more effort. So once you, once you receive a, so if you can compare your Microsoft, you know, you this, this version of Microsoft Windows has a market price of this versus this other type of, this other, this other software has this price, and you can very easily tell which one is more secure. Um, this, you know, vulnerability markets to a certain extent do exist today. Um, you, there are, there are two companies that, uh, you have iDefense and uh, Tipping Point, which are actively purchasing vulnerabilities, um, not quite in a market form. Um, they don't publish the prices that they pay. Um, because it's in their interest not to. Because if ever, if everyone knows how much they're paying, then then you have you have a competitive price and you have a competitive bidding process. But if you can instead just continue to pay lower prices, uh, it, it works in their interest. Um, but the, this may this may very well change. There's another company, Wabi Sabi Lobby, which has issued a lot of press releases. But they, they, their claim is that they are intending to uh, actually publish an open 
vulnerability market where they list the prices. And if, if this were to happen, I think you would get a, you would get a very clear uh, delineation of the relative security of uh, different pieces of software. Um, so that's how you do it. That's, that's one way to increase, to reduce the information asymmetry for software vulnerabilities. But a lot of the problems that are going on, on the internet right now aren't necessarily d down to just software vulnerabilities. You've got you know spam, phishing, malware, all of this stuff. Um, that is that's that's what the user's biggest problem is. Uh, incentives matter here as well. Um, so one one example is that users don't necessarily know when they're dealing with a good website or a bad website. Everyone's got a website. It may have an SSL cert, so that means it's secure. Um, so. Uh, What's the solution to this? Well, there are a number of third-party uh, certification authorities which will issue you a certificate if you pass certain requirements. Um, and you can proudly put the certificate on your website um, and, people, and consumers can look at this and say, yes, oh, I think this site is trustworthy or not. One example is, uh, the biggest example is the trustee uh, certification scheme. Um, now, trustee, you, as you probably know, the only it has very low requirements. The only uh, the only thing it requires is that you have a privacy policy and that you publish it on your website. Um, so this has nothing to do with the, with the security of, of the website or whether or not its a, its inten intentions are genuine or not. Um, and but it's, they're setting the bar very low because they're trying to make money off of certifications. And there's been some research which has shown that the that these signaling devices using, using the trustee certification is actually worse than ineffective. Bad companies are more likely to be certified than good companies with using trustee. Um, so he used data from SiteAdvisor, which tries to de determine whether a site's using, issuing malware. He found that 5.5% of all trustee certified sites were classified as bad, compared to just 2.5% of all sites uh, on, that are found on the web. So, if you, if you come across something with a trustee seal, you should, you should definitely not take anything of use from it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, but it makes perfect sense because if, if, you, if, you're, if you've got a scam going, the first thing you want to do is you want to instill trust into the consumer. And so if you, if you can buy it for a fairly cheap price, then why not do it? Um, he, also, he also, probably more controversially, looked at um, search results on Google and compared the first 10 uh, hits to the first 10 paid advertisements that, go, that come along the side. And he did it for certain, for certain keywords like screensaver, uh, where you have notorious um, out, uh, adware and malware that's often attached. And he found that uh, the sites which had paid advertising were far more likely to, con to be malicious than the sites which appeared naturally in the organic search results. And I think this, this, is, this is a problem. This is a problem for Google and it's a problem for society because what, what's happening is advertisers are exploiting, expo are, are paying money to exploit users. Um, and Google is profiting from it. Um, so what, what are some of the solutions? You could, you could require certification authorities to devote more resources to policing content. You could assign, you could, you could more controversially assign liability to the, the certification authorities. You could make trustee liable if they grant the, the certification without proper vetting. Um, another thing you could do is uh, you could require that the uh, complaints against companies are also published. So, cause, so right now, if someone has a trustee seal, you click on it and it, it takes you to the trustee website and says, yes, this is, a, this is a trustee certified site. But it only says good things about them there. But if you, but if you also require that complaints and r ratings go, go get disseminated as well, that could, have, that could have a positive effect. Um, so now with my remaining time, I'm gonna turn to some work that I've been doing uh, looking at phishing attacks um, recently. So uh, first, the first question is, I guess, how is phishing an economic problem? Why is it not just a technical problem? Um, one is that you have, you have these attackers who are carrying out the phishing attacks, and then you have a range of uh, different, author different uh, entities which are responsible for defending against the attacks. You have banks, ISPs, which are hosting malicious sites. Uh, red domain registrars, and each of these defenders are acting in their, in their own strategic interest, 
And by acting in their own strategic interest, you sometimes can end up with suboptimal uh, outcomes. Um, likewise, you have the, the effort that a defender that these banks take um, also suffers from informational asymmetries. Um, do you know how, how good your particular bank is in removing phishing sites as they appear? Um, do you know how good your, your ISP is at removing, at removing phishing sites and responding to requests to remove phishing sites? There's, the information is not out there, and because of that, you end up getting a free riding effect. Um, and finally, the most, most obvious reason why phishing is economic is that the losses have financial consequences, direct financial consequences. So our contribution is to first describe, we describe how one particular gang of phishing attackers, the rockfish gang, have acted in a very coordinated manner and to, ex to exploit the lack of coordination between the defenders. Um, we, we've, we've empirically measured the response times uh, according to the different the, the type of phishing attack, uh, the bank that's been impersonated, and where the host, uh, hosting site is located. And finally, we come up with a first attempt at uh, estimating the financial loss that's imposed due to phishing uh, based purely on our empirical observations. So um, very quickly, just let me describe the technical requirements for a phishing attack. Um, you know, attackers send out spam impersonating banks with a link to the fake website. Um, from the, the hosted fake site can be done in a couple of ways. It can be hosted on free web space. That's is fairly common. Um, it can be ho the most common ways for it to be instead located on a compromised machine somewhere, uh, URL you know, looking like that. And the, the third approach is to just to register a domain um, that sort of looks like a bank name and then point it back to either one of these free web space or compromised machines. Um, so. That's, that's the hosting side of it. And then, so one, once someone has given away their details to a phishing site, it has to be recovered by the attacker somehow. And this is done in two ways. First, it can be done um, by where the completed forms are automatically sent off to an email, to a drop, email drop account, uh, usually a Gmail or Yahoo uh, webmail account. Um, alternatively, they could be stored in a text file on the, on the spoof website itself, and they go back and retrieve them. So um, the, there, there are different ways to approach phishing. Um, and a lot of the academic research, at least, is focused on sort of what are proact some proactive measures to try to make phishing impossible, and technical measures for that, you know, web browser mechanisms for detecting fake sites, multi-factor authentication, all this sort of thing. But what's actually going on now, today, uh, even as we speak, is these reactive measures where banks get lists of uh, phishing URLs um, that have been reported, and then uh, they add them to a blacklist, which get disseminated out through the anti-phishing toolbars, and then the banks go after um, the hosting site. They send takedown requests to the ISP, which hosts it, or, and also if it's a registered domain, to the registrar. Um, so we, we collected, uh, in fact, we still are collecting uh, phishing reports from several sources, but uh, the one the one I'll be talking about today is from this group called Fish Tank, which is an open uh, group. Uh, that if you go to fishtank.com, they encourage. It's very Web 2.0. They encourage people to come and submit uh, phishing reports, and then they all. And even more than that, they uh, allow people to vote on whether or not uh, you think this is a phishing site or not. You get enough positive votes, then it is. And so that's how they uh, verify the authenticity. Of the submissions, so we've we recorded we we pulled uh, the URLs from Fish Tank, and then we went out and uh, contacted these phishing sites repeatedly, twice an hour, until uh, they stopped responding. Because we we wanted to get an estimate estimate of how long the sites were alive. Okay, um, so uh, before I get into the details of the data uh, results, uh, I want to talk about how. Uh, not all, about a completely different type of phishing attack, uh, and this is called from the Rockfish Gang, and uh, they operate in a completely different manner to standard phishing attacks, and they're actually responsible for about all, half of all phishing, this one particular group. Um, so uh, what they first do is they publish a, several uh, innocuous sounding domains, meaningless names, lof80.info, um, doesn't look like a bank at all. Um, then they send out a phishing email with the URL that looks kind of like this. 
it'll give www.banknamedot um, a unique identifier dot dot and then then finally the domain all the way to the right because because people will look at this and they, they know to look to the left and they see oh there's my bank name it seems legit okay and so people click on that link and then this domain itself uh, they control a name server which resolves this to a number of IP addresses which are uh, compromised servers, botnets, botnets basically, um, which, uh, then, which are only serve as proxies back to a central backend server um, which actually hosts the phishing site itself. So you have, the, you have the domain itself, which doesn't appear to have any phishing site on it. You have the compromised machines in, on the end users, which isn't hosting a phishing site. Uh, it, all it does is serves a proxy back to the actual host. And even more than that, what they do is each, each domain uh, hosts uh, a number of site, a number of, uh, impersonates a number of banks, excuse me, uh, at the same time. Usually around 25 different banks are impersonated for each domain, okay? So depending upon the structure of the right-hand side of the URL, that will determine which bank you go to. So it's, I mean, fairly sophisticated. Um, it's a lot more resilient to failure um, because uh, you have this dynamic pool of uh, domains, which maps onto an equally dynamic pool of IP addresses. Uh, so, as, as one as one of the IP, you contact the ISP, they remove the the IP address, they clean it up, uh, it automatically picks another one, um, and they ha they have this constant pool of domains. Um, so, you, they also increase the confusion because they're splitting the components of the attack over several different responsible. Authorities. You've got the registrar, like I said, who, who has who sees a domain, and then you've got the, the compromised machine owner, which doesn't even not even hosting the site. Um, and because they use this wildcard DNS, it completely confuses Fish Tank and the other and many of the phishing collators. Um, they see uh, 18,000 reports over eight weeks, which is half of all of the reports, which just gets reduced down to only 400 unique domains. So. Um, what we, what we trace over time is, um, this is a, over the period of eight weeks, uh, the, red give, the red dots indicate how many uh, unique rockfish domains are alive on a given day, uh, and the blue shows the number of uh, IP addresses which appear to be operational and responsive. And the, the key thing here is that no matter what, the, it's always greater than zero. <laughs> Uh, they always have some. They always have some IPs operational. They always have domains operational. So you have the banks which are which are going after these domains. But by the time they get to them, there's always there's already a new one operational. Um, so they're making a lot of money, I believe. Um, so then the next thing to look at was how um, look at how many uh, IP addresses uh, are new, newly added each day versus how many get removed. Um, and as you can see, there's a very, a very strong correlation here, which th this, this implies that, there, that there's automated replenishment. As, as an IP address is, gets, gets cleaned up, another one automatically takes its place. Um, it's a lot less coordinated when you look at the domains which are added each day. Uh, it's actually quite unsynchronized, uh, which suggests that they actually manually replenish domains as they're removed. Um, and also this here shows the number of domains versus number of IPs which are removed in a given day. And this is completely uncoordinated, which means, which suggests that the uh, response of the registrar and removing the domain and the response of the ISP is independent. Uh, they're, not, they're not working together uh, in any way that we can see. Um, so let me, let me go back to, um, back to the data analysis of how long the sites stick around for. Um, well, if you look at standard ordinary, rock, ordinary fishing sites, um, they last for an average of 60 hours with a median of around 20. Um, but when you look at uh, the rockfish, um, they succeed, they stick around for a lot longer, 90, uh, uh, over a day longer on average and uh, well, a day and a half longer for the median. Um, so. Uh, they're, they're being a lot more effective um, because their strategy isn't all that well understood by the people who are responsible for defending it. Um, so the, the averages and medians are kind of are very misleading here. Um, this, is, this is a histogram of uh, the site lifetimes and number of days. 
And as you can see, it has a very uh, heavy tail, or no, a very long tail. Um, so uh, what you have is a lot of the sites get removed very quickly, but some of them just slip through the cracks and stick around for longer and longer and longer. We see, we see fishing sites staying, staying around for eight weeks, 10 weeks. I mean, there's, there's all, there are always sites which continue on and on. And this could happen for a number of reasons. This could be because um, the, because the uh, hosting ISP is just not cooperative. This could, this could also just be because uh, the bank is not aware of it. Um, they've, moved on to, they've moved on to new ones. Um, but regardless, what you have here is a very uh, skewed distribution. Um, in fact, uh, I did some curve fitting, um, which shows that this actually follows a log normal distribution, which is a particular type of uh, skewed distribution. Um, so what you, what the, the main thing to take here is that you have uh, a, a small but substantial number of sites, which lasts for very long, uh, which s skew the performance of uh, and the response of the average case. Um, so, um, so that's how long the sites stick around for. Um, the next thing to consider is, okay, so who cares if a site is available if we don't know how many people are visiting it? Um, and through a, through a bit of a trick, we were able to uh, count in a number of cases how many visitors a phishing website received. And I don't know if you're familiar with Webalyzer, but it's a, one of the freely available web page statistics packages. Um, and in fact, Webalyzer is often exploited uh, to, to, <laughs> to host uh, phishing sites as well. Um, but uh, it, g it gives you a nice daily update of how many URLs, or how many, how many visits you've had to each particular URL, um, how many unique visits. Um, and so, fortunately, uh, a lot of these, sometimes, a lot, a lot of the times you will find that Webalizer is um, left in a world readable state. So anyone who goes to the URL can see the, the statistics. Okay, so what we started doing is every time we got a phishing URL, we went and looked to see whether or not it was running Webalizer and if it was world readable. And we found several hundred cases where it was so. Um, and so we kept, we continued going back to get day by day snapshots of how many visitors have gone to the phishing URL. Kind of cool. <laughs> um, so uh, that, would, that gave us an estimate of how many people were visiting the sites. Um, but then we don't even know necessarily whether or not people are visiting the sites because they are giving away their details or may maybe they're just saying die, spam, or die, we hate you, and this sort of thing. Um, so to deal with that, we also found a number of cases where uh, the user details were hosted on the phishing sites and text files, which were also world readable. And so we, got, we had about 400 phishing responses, um, and so we found that half of them were legit, appeared legitimate, uh, and the other half clearly were not. So um, we can use that to, get in, to combine with our Webalizer stats to give us an, a more accurate picture of how many uh, of the visits are um, likely to be legitimate. So this is a day-by-day -day distribution of the, uh, the number of unique responses. Um, it kind of fluctuates a lot because of the, because of the data source, um, but um, you see some days, even all the way up to the fifth day, you can still have around 20 uh, unique user responses to the phishing URL. And this, this is not just the visiting, that you visited the phishing page URL, this is that you've gone through to the thank you page, where you've actually filled in some details. So, um, Yes, so we know how, we, we've got an estimate of how many sites there are, we've got an estimate of how long they seem to stick around for, and we also have an, a separate estimate of uh, about how many users tend to give away their details day by day. Um, so we can sort of put it all together and come up with a very uh, quick and dirty estimate of uh, what the overall cost is, is to phishing. So we observed 14, 38 uh, websites and, and phishing websites in eight weeks, which implies around 10,000 per annum. This, I believe, is a significant undercount, but we'll stick with it for now. Um, we have 61 hours at, as the average uh, lifetime, um, which imply, using, our, uh, using this graph implies around 30 victims per site. Um, Gartner have done a study uh, on uh, identity theft. They surveyed the banks, asked how much money do you tend to lose to so identity theft. Um, it's not specific to phishing, but it's so, but so the estimate is kind of, cost estimate's less than ideal, but it's all we have. They, they estimate that the banks actually end up losing around $572 per victim. They actually lose more than this. They lose around 
1,700, I believe, but uh, they recover a lot of that, and only 542 they actually lose and never recover. Um, so you multiply this together, you, know, you end up with $160 million for the, for the estimated cost here. Um, this does not include the rockfish attacks, which I was just talking to you about, um, because um, there, it's hard, you have to count them differently because they have unique domains and this sort of thing. So uh, as a first pass, our best way of estimating them is that we know that the rockfish account, account for 50% of all spam emails that are related to phishing. So if we can use that as a proxy to suggest that they're getting about half of the, uh, the, the phishing victims. So we, double up, we can double our estimate and end up around $300 million uh, lost per annum. Um, so this is far less than the Gartner estimate, which estimates around two, uh, $2 billion per annum just in the U.S. alone. Um, but so I think a lot of this can be accounted for because we've very conservatively counted sites and we've only counted what we've gotten from fish tank. Uh, we've subsequently gotten other counts from, from different phishing feeds and that suggests that the number of phishing sites is substantially more. Um, the, the other explanation for it is that identity theft could be, there are other causes of identity theft. It could be uh, key loggers, uh, theft of the merchant databases, uh, for example, losing 25 million records in the UK government, this, this sort of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's hard to separate out uh, that. Um, it would be nice if uh, these surveys of banks actually got more specific to the particular means of, uh, of data, of, monetary loss because they often have this information, they just aren't sharing it. Um, so um, if we look more closely at the, the lifetimes of banks, we can see that there's actually very great variation. I already showed you that log normal distribution. Some sites stick around forever, some move very quickly. Um, if we then look at the performance of individual banks and of the ISPs which are hosting phishing sites, we see similar very high variation. Um, this could, if, by publishing this kind of information, we can identify the exceptional performers, those who are very responsive to phishing attacks and removing sites, and those which are not. Um, so if you, so this, this shows the distribution of the number of phishing sites per brand. It's, it's very skewed. PayPal, eBay, Bank of America are the highest targets, but then it continues on. There's a lot more sites which are target impersonated a few times. Um, this is the lifetime distribution. And sorry, the, 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 uh, the x-axis is impossible to read, but those are, uh, those are bank names. Um, and so you can see that uh, the worst performer, which is Egg Bank, uh, they have an average lifetime of around 180 hours. Um, so that's about a week um, before they remove their phishing sites. And you might think, okay, that's all right. But then when you look, there are other banks which are doing a whole lot better. You have Flagstar, which, are, which gets its sites down in under 12 hours on average. Um, so the, the performance could be improved. And um, I, think, I think one of the key things in reducing these information asymmetries is publishing good data which calls out this sort of thing and shows you know, the, which bank is doing better. Uh, you have a question? Yeah. Do you have data on how much each bank is spending? No. Um, they, they keep this very closely guarded. Um, what, what I do have information on is which, which banks um, are doing the takedowns themselves in-house and which ones hire uh, specialist takedown companies. Um, we've, cause we, we've gotten a couple of feeds from specialist companies which whose sole business is taking down phishing sites and they claim that there's a higher proportion of, uh, of sites on the right hand side which are paying for paying these third-party providers uh, versus the ones doing it in-house. And I, I've seen the data, and I, I agree that they seem to be right. Um, but if you, if you take that as a signal for um, spending money, because you probably have to spend more money if you're paying somebody else to do it. Um, so, yeah, I, connecting, connecting this to the investment is an open problem. Um, so we also can look at particular ISPs. Um, and we've done, we've done it for a large variation for, every, for all ISPs across the world, but um, I'm not gonna talk about that today. Uh, I'll just look at the ones which are hosted on uh, free web space. Um, and you can see there, there's, there's, there's great variation. Yahoo is 
uh, by far the best of uh, the free web hosting sites. They, their median takedown time is just around seven hours. Um, some of the other sites tend to be longer, but all in all, this is all better than the standard, uh, the standard uh, phishing sites because it's a free host, so they don't mind cutting off the their, their customer because they're not paying them. Um, so I want to probably sort of conclude by talking about this, this final effect here, which is uh, the, what we've tracked is a number of the uh, domains which have been targeted by rockfish attacks. Um, you have, on the top you have uh, the .hk domain and the .cn domain, and this shows you the, the average site lifetime uh, based upon the day in which it was, was reported. So um, on the left-hand side of the Hong Kong one, you'll see that there seems to be a whole lot of sites which lasted a very long time. This is at the beginning, whenever, whenever Hong Kong was first targeted by the rockfish. And you can see that they kind of just left them there for a long time. And then finally, towards, towards the end of March, early April, they got their act together and decided, okay, this is a problem we have to deal with. And they, start, and they, and they killed them all. And they, and they continue to be targeted, and, but the takedown time is, is better. It's still not very good, though. It's between 100 and 200 hours. Um, but it's, it's certainly better than the 700 hours uh, that you're seeing from at the beginning. And so, likewise, you can see this with .cn. In May, they, they kind of moved over to .cn, and you had a very bad response at first, and then it got better. Um, I don't have the graph for it, but um, uh, shortly after Hong Kong was targeted in, in, in early April, um, the Rockfish gang moved on to Austria, moved on to nick.at, and started registering tons of domains. And this actually caused a bit of a, a, bit of a, uh, a, bit of a fuss, because um, uh, .at was not responsive at all in removing the, in removing the uh, the rockfish domains. Um, they cite they cite legal reasons because these are they because these are banks which are global and not Austrian brands. They did not have the le their legal department advice was that they did not uh, they could not actually remove the domains, um, and so they they continued to hold this line for uh, close to a month, and then uh, Spam House. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. They uh, they. Uh, issued a press release uh, calling out nick.at by name and listing all of the listing all of the live uh, nick.at uh, domains. Um, and shortly thereafter, within a few days, uh, the legal opinion changed, and now there aren't any more uh, rockfish domains on .at. Um, but and I'll, and this is I'm, I'm not trying to uh, blame .at for this because. Rather, what happens here? This is this is a fairly common thing. You have you have when 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 a domain registrar is first targeted, they're not sure how to not sure how to respond to it. Um, they don't do anything for a while, and then they then they kind of decide, okay, yes, we have to do something about it, and they figure out what to do and they start doing it. And you see this sort of clued up clued up effect repeatedly. And and what the attackers are doing is they're 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 moving over from domain registrar to domain registrar. Uh, just exploiting the lack of coordination between registrars. Um, and they'll, they'll continue to be able to do this so long as there are more registrars to choose from. Um, but so we're, we're dealing with an attacker which is, is quite adaptive. Um, so, uh, right. Um, the, the Rockfish gang have, have really benefited because by cooperating and colluding together. They've, they've, they've come up with a system which impersonates many banks at one time, um, and it's quite, it's quite re resilient. Um, and this probably should have actually acquired, uh, att attracted more attention from the banks themselves, because you've got, you've got 25 banks which are being uh, hosted as an impersonator at a given time. But as it turns out, there is very little cooperation between the banks and uh, removing the sites. Um, so, uh, I don't know. I, I think this. I think this could. This could be.